Welcome. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast, the show that cuts through the fog of war and updates you about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. With your host, Linnea Hubbard. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts. I'm Linnea Hubbard and today is Wednesday, April 12th, 2023 and the end of week 59 of the Russia-Ukraine War. It's been 3,332 days since Russia occupied Crimea on February 27, 2014, and 413 days since the large-scale invasion of Ukraine began. Today's podcast looks at what happened yesterday in the Russia-Ukraine War. The Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Report is compiled by our team from around the world. Today's report includes information from direct contacts in Ukraine and their proxies, Russian Ministry of Defense reports, the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine reports, Operational Commands North, South, and East of Ukraine, Open Source Intelligence, our in-house team of analysts and geolocation experts, and pro-Ukrainian and pro-Russian mill bloggers and social media accounts with a track record of trying to be accurate. We have one mission. To report the truth. Because the truth matters. Let's start with our assessment of the current status of the war. First, we believe there is a significant chance of a large-scale Russian missile strike between April 12th and April 22nd. We expanded the window after the date for the Rammstein 11 meeting, April 21st, was announced. Second, the Russian VKS and naval forces are experiencing a critical shortage of precision munitions with the Russian Air Force relying on GLONASS-guided glide bombs to attack border regions of Ukraine. Third, the Russian Federation Armed Forces are combat ineffective and have exhausted their combat potential except in the Bakhmut operational area. Fourth, we maintain the Ukrainian defense of Bakhmut has reached its final phase and Ukrainian forces are executing a planned retrograde operation. Fifth, Russian forces are experiencing a theater-wide shortage of non-precision artillery munitions, particularly anti-tank guided missiles, or ATGMs. Sixth, we maintain that short of using chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear, also known as seaburn, weapons, the Russian military will continue doing everything possible to capture Bakhmut, regardless of the cost. And finally, Russian white nationalism connected to the Russian Orthodox Church and senior policymakers within Russian President Vladimir Putin's orbit are fueling religious and racial tension. One year ago yesterday, on April 11, 2022, Russian forces continued to build up troops and supplies and improve their ground lines of communication, called GLOCs, those are supply lines, to Izum. Two Russian battalion tactical groups attempted to probe Ukrainian defenses but were repulsed. In the Donbass, the siege of Mariupol entered the 40th day, with the city likely bisected. Another 150 members of the Ukrainian 36th Naval Infantry surrendered. Fighting to the west of Severodonetsk and in Popazna and Rubizhne continued. Russian missiles struck the airport in Dnipro, causing heavy damage, and Kharkiv was heavily shelled. Russian General Alexander Dvornikov, also known as the Butcher of Syria, was made the overall commander of military operations in Ukraine. There was a purge of the FSB in Moscow, with 150 agents dismissed. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov warned Sweden and Finland not to join NATO, threatening, quote, consequences if they initiated the process. Ukrainian war crimes investigators found six bodies in a basement in Brovary. All of the victims had been shot in the head. Our analysis determined that 40 Russian battalion tactical groups were rendered combat ineffective between February 24 and April 5, 2022, after the failed northern offensive toward Kyiv. In addition, we wrote, quote, Russia is building up military forces for what appears to be a significant offensive in the Donbass, end quote. Our team estimated that an effective combat force of fresh BTGs with 50 to 60,000 soldiers would be used for the new offensive. Also on this day, the Black Sea Fleet's flagship, Moskva, 
left the port of Sevastopol for the last time. Let's get some regional updates, starting with Kharkiv. In the Dvorichna operational area, the Russian Ministry of Defense, or MOD, claimed there was fighting for control of Sinkivka and the Ukrainian attack failed. However, a geolocated video showed the Ukrainian 14th Separate Motor Rifle Brigade attacking Russian positions in the forested area north of the village, using a captured Russian BMP-2 Infantry Fighting Vehicle, or IFV. Moving on to the Donbass region in Luhansk. Operational Command East, or OKE, Colonel Serhii Cherevati, described fighting in Luhansk as, quote, skirmishes, with 12 localized clashes. Russian forces reportedly fired 384 shells, mortars, and rockets, and the VKS conducted nine ground attack sorties. These numbers are significantly lower compared to the start of March. In the Svatova operational area, Russian forces attempted to attack Ukrainian positions in Novoselivsk from the south and failed. In the Kremina operational area, attacks by Russian forces in the direction of Makievka failed, with Ukrainian troops counterattacking and recapturing lost positions east of the village. We made a minor map update based on the geolocated information. A Russian attempt to advance west from Nevsky and west from the forests around Chervonopopivka also failed. Further south, the situation is unchanged, with Russian forces attempting to advance in the directions of Yampolivka and Terny from the forested areas west of Kremina and continued fighting in the Serebriansky woods. The General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, or GSAFU, reported continued fighting in the area of Vilohorivka the one in Luhansk, with no change in the situation. In northeast Donetsk, in the Siversk operational area, fighting restarted south of Spirna in an area of trees that Ukrainian and Russian forces have traded control over for weeks. Ukrainian forces conducted a localized offensive on Sakui Ventseti and forced the Russian troops holding the damaged T-513 highway bridge over the Vasyukivka River to flee, recapturing the position. The Bakhmut operational area continued to experience the heaviest fighting. The Ukrainian Deputy Minister of Defense, Hanna Malyar, said, quote, It is in Bakhmut where the enemy, she means Russia, is concentrating their main efforts, so we have to concentrate ours there in response in order to stop them. In fact, Bakhmut has now taken the main blow of the enemy's armed forces and their private armies in the east. End quote. Malyar justified the continued defense of the city, adding that if the defense were not held in Bakhmut, Russian forces would simply advance deeper into Ukraine. It has now been 253 days since the first Russian attack on the administrative border of the city on August 2, 2022. Private military company, or PMC Wagner head Yevgeny Prigozhin, said that all fighting outside Bakhmut had been turned over to the Russian MOD, and that Russian airborne forces were defending the flanks. The Russian 217th Airborne Regiment attempted to advance in the directions of Hryurivka, Bohdanivka, and Hromove, but none of the attacks were successful. In the northern part of Bakhmut, Russian mercenary mill blogger Rybar claimed that School 24 was still under Ukrainian control. Fighting continued in the Rose Alley area and a two-block strip west of the train tracks. And based on the most recent intelligence, we adjusted the map in this region. This does not represent Ukrainian territorial gains. There was conflicting information about the situation in Bakhmut, Ukrainian source Deep State all but said the eastern defensive line in the center and southeast part of the city collapsed. They reported that Russian forces had captured Avangard Stadium, train station number one, the state police station, and the grain elevators west of the train tracks. If true, Ukrainian forces have two more significant defensive areas before being pushed out of the city. Deep State insisted their information was accurate, writing, quote, be careful when watching the winning insiders who, after our changes, will suddenly start writing the same thing, or will wait a couple of days for a visual confirmation of the changes to appear. End quote. 
The challenge we are having with accepting their version of the situation is visual evidence and multiple Russian reports that don't support that these areas were lost, quote, in recent days. Rybar continued to walk back earlier claims of the state police station being captured, now reporting that an area of homes north of the station is under Wagner's control. Pro-Russian photojournalist and propagandist Yarem Shuter shared a video from the SK Metallurgical Stadium showing it was under Russian control. He reported the stadium as a, quote, unfriendly place under direct fire from Ukrainian tanks and frequent attacks with 120mm mortars. He claimed that PMC Wagner remains 200 meters from Railroad Station 1 and that Russian forces control most of Verkhny Park. In our assessment, in the southern part of Bakhmut, fighting continued near Avantgarde Stadium, with Russian forces reaching Bakhmutska Avenue. Multiple Russian sources claim there have been breaches of Ukrainian positions north of Korsunskoho Street, but PMC Wagner can't hold these gains and inevitably get pushed back. No significant fighting was reported by reliable or semi-reliable sources around the MiG-17 or south of Bakhmut. There was one other interesting development. With Russian forces now directly engaged in the fighting for Bakhmut, the Russian MOD wrote, quote, In the Donetsk direction, the main efforts in the fighting were concentrated in the area of the city of Artemovsk, that's Bakhmut. Assault troops Wagner continued to fight to seize the quarters in the central part of Artemovsk and push the enemy to the western outskirts of the village. On the flanks, the actions of the assault squads are supported by units of the airborne forces. End quote. In case you didn't catch that, this is the first time Wagner Group has been referred to in the Russian MOD morning report, their fighters not referred to as volunteers, and a public message of cooperation between the PMC and the Kremlin. The Russian MOD also reported their units conducted 40 fire missions in the Bakhmut operational area, and aviation carried out 11 ground attack sorties. In our assessment, these were surprisingly low numbers. A video showed six soldiers with the Luhansk Territorial Guard holding off PMC Wagner for three hours in a near-constant firefight, even becoming surrounded at one point. A fire team broke the encirclement, aided in completing the defense, and forced PMC Wagner mercenaries to retreat. So, this video contrasts sharply with the Wargonzo fake combat video we analyzed last week. In this video, good tactics for providing suppressive fire with light weapons were demonstrated, the unit worked collaboratively, and best of all, there weren't any overdubbed fake combat sounds. As with most of the photos and videos we reference here on the podcast, we do link to the video in our full situation report on Patreon. In southwest Donetsk, in the Avdiivka operational area, no fighting was reported on the Krasnohorivka Plateau. Retired Lieutenant Colonel Andriy Morozov of the 2nd Army Corps, better known as the Russian mill blogger Murs, blasted Russian propagandist Anna Dolgaryova for reporting a glorious Russian victory north of Spartak and Opitne. We've documented through geolocated videos that Russian forces have lost ground and suffered catastrophic losses in this area after a series of failed offensives. Morozov wrote, quote, Anya, that was not a battle, but just another execution. The Ukrainians allowed the BMPs, he actually means infantry fighting vehicles, or IFVs, with dismounts to come close. VDV dismounted, went forward, the dismounts were destroyed with mortars and then finished off with small arms. The BMPs burned. No one from the VDV returned. They were just targets in a shooting range. The question about the senseless meat grinder that has been going on for months in the 1st Slavic Brigade, 5th Brigade, 100th Brigade, and other units storming Ukrainian positions near Donetsk, near Avdiivka, and near Marinka, has been repeatedly raised. People are already openly talking about it, with these very words, meat, meat assaults. Talking about these, using these bad words, are relatives of those taking part in the meat grinders. Why exactly the 1st Brigade was nicknamed Meat, and the complaints are mainly to the command of this brigade? We are running out of infantry. No longer good infantry, but simply infantry in general. Just infantry to securely hold the positions that we have, on the defensive. 
In fact, we're almost out, including vehicles. End quote. Some assessment here. Modazov provided brutal assessments about Russian military operations after the May 2022 river crossing disaster in Milohorivka, the one in Luhansk, and was the first to sound the alarm of weakening Russian defenses south of Izum in June of the same year. He accurately reported the situation in Sherwood Forest and the resulting combat destruction of two Russian BTGs. Morozov was already taken into custody once for his writings on LiveJournal and had more than one of his blog entries censored. Further, we've geoconfirmed videos and pictures showing that Russian forces have suffered heavy losses in these areas. Russian forces continued attacks with ground troops on Avdiivka with minimal artillery support, which ended in failure. Fighting in the no-man's land between Vodyana and Sievrne continued, and Russian attempts to advance west of Vodyana along the reservoirs were unsuccessful. Positional fighting in the eastern part of Pervomaiske continued, and Russian forces continued their renewed attempts to advance on the Ukrainian firebase at Nevelske. In the Marinka operational area, a Ukrainian source reported fighting east of Krasnohorivka with no change in the situation. Heavy fighting continued in Marinka around Druzhby Avenue, with the 1st Army Corps furiously trying to secure the remains of the city, which would gain them control of the N-15 highway. In the Velika Novosilka operational area, a video showed Ukrainian troops south of Novosilka on the Donetsk Zaporizhia administrative border being shelled by Russian forces. We had this area assessed as under Russian control, and based on this new intelligence, we made a small adjustment to the war map. Informal markets have been a mainstay for the residents of Mariupol and Russian lifestyle propagandists like Natasha from Russia, who, during her November trip to the city, which we reported on in our December 5th podcast, pointed them out as a sign of improving conditions. But now local officials have started shutting down the markets, claiming it's being done for sanitary reasons and due to complaints from people living in nearby buildings. People of Occupy Donetsk who are listening to this podcast, stay safe. This episode is brought to you by KPMG. At KPMG, innovation is the go-to state of mind. Their visionary thinkers and advanced technology help you see beyond the now, uncover new insights, and turn them into opportunities. KPMG can help you leverage the value of data and drive transformational outcomes through innovation. To explore their thinking, go to kpmg.us. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. Our team of journalists, researchers, and analysts is funded by readers, listeners, and viewers just like you. To support independent journalism, please consider becoming a patron. You can find us on patreon.com at Malcontent News. Moving on to Zaporizhia. In the Orihiv operational area, Ukrainian forces made a small advance toward Robotine, retaking positions lost at the end of March. Russian officials announced that public elections for the governor and other officials in occupied Zaporizhia would not happen. Instead, the regional parliament will choose the new leaders aligned to Moscow in September. There was no update on the status of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. In the Black Sea, Crimea, Mykolaiv, and Odessa region, Captain Natalia Khomenyuk of Operational Command South, or OKS, reported eight Black Sea Fleet vessels are on patrol including one Kilo-class submarine capable of launching up to four caliber cruise missiles. She continued to caution that the risk of an upcoming Russian missile attack is high, but panic is unnecessary, saying, quote, Yes, Russians can gravitate towards such sacred dates. It is enough to remember the Palm Sunday of this year when there was an attack on Zaporizhia, or a blow on the eve of Easter last year, end quote. She added that Russian reconnaissance drone activity remained high. In occupied Crimea, Sergei Oksyanov said that the May Day celebrations, the procession of the Immortal Regiment, and the Victory Day Parade on May 9th had been cancelled in Sevastopol. Shortly after, Gauleiter Mikhail Razvozhayev, the illegitimate mayor of Sevastopol, denied the claim, saying, quote, The decision to cancel the military parade for May 9th in Sevastopol has not been made at the moment. 
consultations are underway with the Ministry of Defense. The decision to hold the parade in Sevastopol is the prerogative of the military department. End quote. On the Russian front, Russian state media is reporting that a drone delivered IED hit the outer edge of the Shukhov airport in Bilgorod, about 30 kilometers from the Ukrainian border. The fence and perimeter alarm system was damaged in the strike. Russian officials have not assessed blame, and Kyiv did not confirm nor deny its involvement. In Chechnya, sectarian violence erupted for the second time in a week. In Gvardiskoye, the Rosguardia fought with a group of separatists who had attacked Chechen security forces earlier in the North Caucasus. Colonel General and aspiring dentist Ramzan Don Don Kadyrov claims one person was captured. The Russian Federal Customs Service has been shut down nationwide for two days, with officials claiming the issue is related to a software failure. Let's talk about developments theater-wide and outside Ukraine. The average number of Russian attacks has steadily declined since the beginning of March. From an average of 118 a day from March 1st to March 10th, to an average of 52 per day last week. In the month of March, Russian forces captured approximately 71 square kilometers. That is the smallest amount of territorial gains, not counting months where they were on the defensive, since August 2022. The Russian winter offensive captured approximately 341 square kilometers. That's 131 square miles, or an area equal to Brownsville, Texas, for those who prefer to measure in units of Texas. In Bakhmut, the captured Russian T-80 BVM main battle tank, nicknamed Bunny by Ukrainians, with 24 confirmed kills, including up to half a dozen tank-on-tank, met an inglorious end. Bunny was originally part of the Russian 200th Separate Motor Rifle Brigade and was captured on March 2, 2022, put in service with the Ukrainian military a week later. In Bakhmut, however, Russian General Rasputitsa put a firm grip on the celebrity MBT, and there was no way to recover the vehicle. To be clear, General Rasputitsa is the mud, and Bunny was very thoroughly stuck in the mud. Without a Ukrainian farmer and a John Deere tractor in sight, a decision had to be made. Instead of abandoning Bunny and risking having it fall back into Russian hands, the T-80 tank was destroyed in place by combat engineers. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky held another meeting of the Stavka, which is the staff of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, and provided a public readout. In his nightly address, he warned against having two Ukraines, with one part battered by war and the other returning to some degree of pre-war normalcy, saying, quote, We are now at such a stage of the war when it is important for our society and partners not to lose a sense of the path we have to take. That's the way the path ahead. Compared to last year, many places are quieter now, but this does not mean you can ignore the war somewhere or be less focused on helping the state. We managed to do a lot together with our partners to protect people, Ukraine, and the whole of Europe. But this does not mean that now is the time to rest on our laurels. The way is ahead. The movement is ahead. Something for which we need no less unity than before, no less focused than before. In the same way as before, our positions at the front, all our soldiers at the positions, must be supported by Ukrainian positions politically and informationally, by the power of arms and the power of our social unity, by our internal stability and the strength of Ukraine's ties with the world. And this is the task of both the state and everyone in the state, both of Ukraine and everyone in the world who values a free life and an international order based on rules. It is unreasonable to just passively hope that someone else will bring victory, the one who is now in the trenches, who is now in the assaults. This is a joint task. Victory is won by all. End quote. Our analyst team noticed an uptick in requests for blood donations across Ukraine, despite the overall reduction in fighting theater-wide compared to six weeks ago. We can't assess if there is a supply issue or if Ukrainian officials are starting to build up a supply in preparation for the widely anticipated spring counteroffensive. 
Whole blood has a shelf life of 21 to 35 days, depending on the anticoagulant used during donation. If this is increasing the supply to support battlefield medicine in the future offensive, it hints that the start is 15 to 30 days away. United States Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin announced that the Rammstein 11 contact group for the defense of Ukraine would be held virtually on April 21st. The main topics included air defense, armored vehicles, 155mm ammunition, and electronic warfare systems. Canada announced it will provide Ukraine with 21,000 assault rifles, 38 unspecified machine guns, and 2.4 million rounds of ammunition. South Korean publication Donga reports that Washington and Seoul have agreed to an arrangement to, quote, loan 500,000 155mm artillery shells. South Korean law forbids selling or sharing ammunition with any nation at war, but in a tripartite agreement, the South Korean ammunition will replenish United States stocks. In theory, this would enable the United States to provide 155mm ammunition from its strategic reserve and would replenish its own inventory and South Korea's as peacetime war production increases. An unnamed South Korean official said, quote, After finding a way to respond in good faith to the request of the United States, our blood ally, while adhering to the government principle of not providing lethal weapons to Ukraine, we decided to provide them in a rental manner instead of significantly increasing the supply of shells. End quote. There continues to be rampant speculation and analysis of the leaked Pentagon documentation. We maintain our editorial stand that we will not engage in speculation based on the content of those documents. Speaking of speculation, let's talk about the Russian military mobilization and MIR. Russian State Duma Deputy Andriy Kartapolov and head of the Russian State Duma Defense Committee denied rumors that mobilization is being planned after the Russian Federation government passed a series of new laws around conscription, including mandatory visits to the commissariat by all men subject to the draft to verify their contact information and to get a so-called invitation to receive military training. He also said that based on the new laws, all summonses are, quote, considered received from the moment it is placed in the personal account of the person liable for military service, end quote, even if sent electronically. So if you are a man of conscription age in Russia, you had better check your apps and text messages frequently. In Sevastopol, military body armor has appeared for sale in hypermarkets. Those are similar to like Super Walmart, H Mart, or Alsha. The package costs 70,000 rubles, or about 860 U.S. dollars. It had better be NIJ-compliant Class 4 ceramic with shrapnel protection and not made in China at that price point. Retired Lieutenant Colonel Morozov had a concluding paragraph to his rant about the situation in Avdiivka, which painted a grim picture of Russian readiness for a Ukrainian counteroffensive and the future of the Putin regime, saying, quote, and then there will be the Ukrainian offensive. How will you be telling about it, Anya? How will you explain why the front rolled back so sharply to the east? How will you explain to people why, having wasted one wave of mobilization for meat quickly enough, it is necessary to waste the next one even faster? How to throw men caught all over the country who cannot hit anything with a machine gun under the roller of fresh Ukrainian reserves brought into battle? How will you explain to people that there is no need to overthrow the bloody regime which sent them into slaughter and ruined their relatives and friends for nothing? End quote. That's actually a really good question, Anya, and I would love to hear your answer. Because it's starting to feel like Lieutenant Colonel Morozov maybe doesn't think that everything is going to plan. In our War Crimes and Human Rights segment, we discuss events that might be upsetting to hear about. There is graphic detail in today's report, so please feel free to skip ahead to the next segment. Timestamps are in the description. Two videos are being widely shared on Russian social media and spilling over into the Ukrainian information space of Ukrainian soldiers being beheaded or just after being beheaded by PMC Wagner Group mercenaries or other Russian-aligned troops. The first video we were aware of was released around April 8th and shared on a Telegram channel we monitor. 
That video, which CNN claimed is not publicly available, shows two Ukrainian soldiers next to a destroyed M113 armored personnel carrier, or APC, and a laughing Wagner mercenary saying, quote, They killed them. Someone came up to them. They came up to them and cut their heads off. End quote. The two soldiers had their hands removed also. The incident reportedly happened in the Bakhmut operational area, and pictures appeared the next day of a head that had been impaled on a tree branch in the city. The second video was filmed last summer with the geography unknown. In that video, a live and conscious Ukrainian prisoner of war's head is cut off, slowly with a dull knife. The video, even among our experienced authentication team, is almost unbearable to watch and is being celebrated on Russian social media. The POW screams in pain with one of the executioners saying, quote, Get to work, brothers. Break his spine. F*** have you never cut off a head? End quote. The head is then held up to the camera, and the soldiers suggest sending the head to the murdered soldier's commander. This is the second execution of a Ukrainian POW released on Russian social media channels in less than two months. The head of the security service of Ukraine, Vasil Malyuk, did not mince words, saying, quote, We will find these inhumans. If necessary, we will get them wherever they are, from underground or from the other side of the world, but they will definitely be punished for what they have done. End quote. We are not providing links to either video due to their extremely graphic nature and brutality, and we offer a word of strong caution should you choose to search them out on your own. Russian forces shelled the Greek Orthodox Church, Church of the Nativity of the Most Holy Theotokos in Kherson, in an overnight attack during Holy Week. No one was injured. A quick errors and omissions. Ukrainian officials reported that the Ukrainian prisoner of war filmed talking to his mother after his release on April 10th had learned that he was a new dad. It's been clarified that he learned he was a new uncle. And his niece was born the day before he was released from Russian captivity. In economic news, Russian leaders have implemented an unofficial blockade of grain vessels transiting the Black Sea as part of the Russian, Ukrainian, Turkish, and United Nations grain initiatives. According to an official with the Ukrainian Ministry of Infrastructure, Russian inspectors struck the names of the vessels for inspection off the list with no explanation. The deputy minister said, quote, Due to such actions of the representatives of the aggressor country, not a single ship could continue its journey, which is tantamount to a blockade from Moscow. End quote. And that's what we know. Join me again tomorrow for more updates. Until then, stay safe, everyone. You've been listening to the Malcontent News Russia Ukraine War Podcast. To help keep us independent, please consider providing financial support by becoming a patron. Want on demand news in your hand? Download the Google News app and make Malcontent News one of your favorites to receive breaking news updates. Thank you for listening.